So uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. We're actually going to read the whole chapter of Hebrews, uh, to be honest with you. Um, so, yeah, chapter. So, but, but listen, I, I wanted to. So I'm titling tonight's message. I'm titling it. There is a shaking coming part one. And I'll probably preach the second part on Wednesday. You know, I do. I will say this, that I believe that over the next um, three sermons, I feel as though what the Lord showed me is that these next three sermons are looking at the Word of God from a little bit of a different angle than a lot of, than, than the way that we typically look at the Word of God. Usually, and it's and it's not that we're that we're wrong for doing it. It's just I believe a natural tendency that when we view the Word of God, we view it from the standpoint of we put ourselves there, right? And we're we're viewing the Word of God on how it's going to affect us, how it's going to bless us, how what we need to learn in order for our life. To, um, to, to be in line with God's will. Uh, I believe that these next three messages are looking from a different viewpoint and that, the, and that they're actually looking from the angle as though we're viewing God's word through his eyes, through what he sees, what his plan is and how he sees us. Um, and so again, uh, you know, the Lord put this on my heart a couple of days before New Year and uh, the, about the shaking, amen. And so, in, in in Hebrews chapter twelve, that's actually the, the a verse of scripture towards the end of Hebrews twelve. It talks about anything that can be shaken will be shaken, so that what is left is that that that's going to remain. Yes. And I want you to know that I believe with all of my heart that there's that there's already a shaking taking place, and that there's going to be we're going to continue to see a shaking in the spiritual. Realm, amen. So I want to uh, go. Listen, I want to be in the ESV if that's okay with you. And uh, again, uh, yeah. So we're going to be in the ESV. We're going to and we're going to read Hebrews chapter eleven. And what, as I'm preaching, on, I'm preaching to you Hebrews twelve, and it's part one and two. But but as I started studying, I realized that the context that I really needed to read to you the whole chapter of Hebrews eleven. I hope you don't mind reading. Some Bible tonight, amen. Uh, I think that's a good thing. You know, as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul told young Timothy, the pastor, he said, pay attention to the public reading of Scripture, yes. amen. amen. And pay attention to your doctrine, he said. It's real important. He said, by, by paying attention to your doctrine, you will not only save yourself, but also your hearers, amen. Right. So here we go. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. A commendation is, is a word of encouragement. A, common, a commendation is a word of approval. So we're hearing here that the people of old in the Old Testament, the original believers, uh, received a commendation through their faith in God. Amen. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I want to I want to say this real quick. I want to say that whenever I'm looking, whenever I saw this chapter this time, when I was reading it earlier this morning, I don't think I ever saw it quite the way that it did today. And so I just want to kind of share with you what the Lord was showing me. In this chapter, I saw it almost like it was a synopsis of God's plan. I mean, it was there the whole time, and you might have seen it, some of you, because you love the Word of God. I just never really saw it quite like that. I think that in the past, I either read through it too fast, or I read through it in choppy ways, picking certain scriptures. But when I read it as a whole in the context of chapter 12, what I saw was it, within it is a message that God wants you and I to understand that he has a plan. He's been working this plan and that there's people that have gone before you and I that believed his plan, believed him at his word and followed him. So I want you to keep that in mind. And so it says in verse four, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Now, I, I want to just stop right there just for a second. I know I can't keep doing this the whole way through. But, but I want you to know that this is what we're told here is that Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was not. 
And if we take the whole story into account, what we understand is that Abel offered a lamb or an animal sacrifice that was without blemish. And what Cain brought was the fruit of the work of his hands. Now, what we need to understand is, is that the fruit of the work of the hands many times is a sign of works. And what Abel offered was a blood sacrifice that, that, that and it cost him some. You know, whenever we're going to serve the Lord, listen, it costs Jesus everything. But if you and I are going to live for the Lord, it's going to cost us some things. OK, I want you to know that. And, and, and another thing I want you to know is this, is that I definitely believe that Cain's offering was a type of works. And let me tell you why, because look at his response. See, his motives were not pure. If his motives were pure, because look, sometimes we we do the work of our hands. Even Abel was 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 tending the flocks, right? And and it required work, but Abel offered it as a sacrifice and he was offering it as unto the Lord. And a lot of times what we're doing for the Lord, it depends also on our motives in our heart and our attitudes of worship towards God, whether or not these things are accepted by God or not. And when we see the response of Cain, we see that even though you could theoretically bring some vegetables, that was not his heart wasn't right. Because when God told him that the that the sacrifice was rejected, what ended up happening is, is that his heart became bitter. His heart became hard. And the end result of that was that the first murder took place on the earth. And we got to be careful that our motives are right when we're approaching the Lord. Amen. So it says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. You know, I'm not, I may not even read every single word right here, but let me just stop again. <laughs> because do you understand the times when Enoch was walking with God that we don't even understand how wicked those times were? This is right on the precipice of the ark getting ready to be built. This is at a time that we're not, we're not time to get into this, but let us just be reminded that when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they came in unto them. And there were Nephilim in the land in those days. And God saw that the intent and the heart of man was continuously wicked and he had to destroy the earth with a flood. You and I have been living in America for the last however hundreds of years that this country has been in existence and we have been living in freedom and liberty and great light and I am so thankful for that but I'm here to tell you that, it, that this world was not always this way and the only reason I'm bringing that up to you is because looking through the eyes of God I'm here to tell you that they got some things going on on this earth that God's up to some things and he's looking for some people that are willing to yoke themselves together with him and to work with him and that's what he's looking for and that's and that's what we're going to hear in some of these people so Enoch walked with God according to the Old Testament and then he was no more God so he was a righteous man in the midst of a wicked generation and God, and God was pleased with his walk God was pleased with his life and God took him Enoch was taken up. He didn't see death. Verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, God's got a plan and he's not giving up on his plan. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that God didn't just wipe out the whole human creation. The scripture teaches, and I don't want to get into this too much, but it says that Noah was perfect in all his generation. Many, many scholars believe that that is actually talking about his DNA, that his DNA was not tainted with Nephilim DNA. Okay. And that, and that God promised and through this family gave hope in the new world, gave hope with a new start. Because God is up to something even bigger than the world that you and I understand right now. God is actually making right something that happened prior 
to the creation that you and I understand that we're living on today. Now, I can, some of this is speculation, but some of it I can prove through the scripture, but I don't have time. There are things that have taken place in the, in the eternity of God that, that took place before man was ever formed of the, of the dirt of the earth, and these celestial angelic beings rebelled against God, and now they have injected what their, their rebellion into the human race and God is looking for people on the earth that are willing to believe him at his word yes. and, 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 he, and it pleases him when he finds people that are willing to believe him at his word it says by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of a place that he was to receive as an inheritance so after the flood God says I'm going to make myself a nation I'm going to make myself a nation and I needed somebody that's going to believe me when I call them to come out of their father's house. And, and by faith, he obeyed when he was called to go out of that place to receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That is so, I highlighted that in my life. Yeah, awesome. That is so powerful. He was looking for a city that has foundations. He's not looking for a better city to move to, for a better job promotion, for a better place where he can graze his cattle. Listen to me. I, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is true because whenever Abraham and Lot became prosperous, y'all remember the story. Abraham said, listen, we have too many cattle. We have to separate. He said, listen, you pick where you want to go and then I'll go in the other direction. What I'm trying to tell you is that Abraham was making choices in his life based on an eternal promise that God had given to him. He was not making his, his, his decisions based upon temporary circumstances. He was looking for a city that had the foundations whose designer and builder is God. Amen. He's looking, he's looking for the celestial city. That's Pilgrim's Progress if you read in the book. He's on a journey looking for the celestial city. But listen, church. If we're honest with one another, you and I, even as Christians, have still been on the journey of looking for our own city. We have still been on the journey for looking for a good field where we can settle ourselves down. I'm not saying God doesn't want to take care of you because he does. I'm trying to say that if we make our decisions based upon what we think is best for us in this temporary world, we're missing the will of God for our lives because there's something bigger here. Amen? All right. So by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. You see all these people of faith and all of these impossibilities, right? All of these, but God keeps showing up. God keeps up. Her womb was barren. There was no hope. Abraham was 99. She was 90. Everything was dried up. There was no hope in it, but God showed up because he is committed to accomplishing what he is going to do. And then it says it in verse 12. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Wow. Oh, wow. God gave a promise to Abraham. Yeah, I want to encourage you right now in your life. If God's given you promises and he's spoken things to you and it seems impossible, and there's some things that I'm, gonna, I'm holding on to the Lord. Amen. I'm holding on to I have, I have no breath left that God is going to show up and God is going to deliver. Amen. And there is nothing impossible. Look, look what Ross just preached. I mean, come on. Out of darkness and nothingness. That is where God thrives. God makes dead things live. There is nothing impossible for the God that we serve. He is a God of faith. He spoke. He had faith that when he spoke, out of nothing, things were coming into existence. He wants us to be able to trust him. Because listen to me, child of God. He is committed to causing this plan to move forward. And whenever it looks like things are impossible, that's exactly when he's ready to show up. And so if you and I are connected to him and his bigger plan and his in the point that he's trying to accomplish upon this earth, whenever we need him to show up 
in these circumstances, he wants to show up and he wants to accomplish what needs to be done. Amen. So these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return, right? Like, like it, where did you come from? See, if you, if you and I are, are believers that were saved out of the world, and there's still some of that world in us, and we're still seeking that world, there's, there's constantly that draw. Yeah. There's constantly that opportunity that we might be willing to go back. Right. Not these guys. Once they knew it, church, they were committed, eyes focused forward, ready to march. Ready to march and to move forward to do the work of the kingdom, believing that there was a city that they had to make it to whose builder and maker was God. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Now, listen, I don't mean to be negative, but let me ask a reverse question. Is God ashamed to be called the God of the people that are looking for a city on earth? I'm just asking the question. In other words, people that are building a kingdom on earth and are not looking forward to the eternal promises of God and are instead exchanging the hope of glory for their own desires. By faith Abraham when he was tested. Offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises. Was in the act of offering up his only son. Of whom it was said through Isaac. Shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able. Even to raise him from the dead. From which figuratively speaking. He did receive him back. I mean what a perfect picture of Jesus in Calvary. Amen. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Think about that. I don't think I ever even took the time to think about this before. But here, Jacob loses Joseph because his brothers pull this quick maneuver on him, right? Bring this deception. J Jacob just thinks that Joseph's dead all these years. And then finally, Jacob realizes and he comes back to Egypt. They give him the land of Goshen. And he begins to, when he's about to pass away, he lays his hands on his offspring. And he ends up laying his hands on Joseph's boys. And I've never thought of this before, but it's like, no, these ain't boys ain't Egyptian. These boys are Hebrew. And I'm about to lay the blessing of Abraham upon these boys. So sometimes it seems like it's lost, but God's not losing anything. And he's coming back with a plan because these two boys were part of the promises of the tribes of Israel. I'm here to tell you tonight, God has a plan and he's sticking to his plan and he's not going to let anything get in the way. Amen. Amen. But look at this in verse 22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Joseph prophetically said, y'all about to get up and get out of this place. And he said, guess what? Ephraim and Manasseh, they weren't, he, they weren't Egyptians and I'm not an Egyptian either. Don't you leave my bones over here. You bring my bones to the promised land because we're going to make it over there. Praise God. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. The King James Version said to enjoy a season of of sin. Instead, he said, no, I refuse to do that. And many times, listen, people in the church and, and, and me as a Christian before has made that bad choice to choose instead of the eternal road towards the Lord, a momentary season regarding the pleasure of sin. You do not want to trade in the plan of God for your life. Come on. For a momentary 
moment of pleasure of sin. All right. And, and, and Moses said, no, when he came to the realization, I don't know when it happened, but when he came to the realization that he was a Hebrew, and I mean, I'm not going to get graphic. I've been graphic about it before, but there were some things that made him realize that he was not one of the Egyptians. And whenever, whenever he realized what the call was on his life, he did. He tried to take matters into his own hands. He went, he went, I just recently listened to a preacher talk about it. He said, look, Moses knew the will of God for his life, but he didn't understand the timing or how God was going to do it. He got out ahead of God. We've got to be careful because many times we know the will of God, but then we try to, we try to leapfrog God's timing. Don't you get ahead of God, my friend. Because getting, trying to get ahead of God is actually operating in the flesh. Instead of waiting on the Spirit of God to have His way. And many times people are like, oh no, and we get nervous. This is not even in the notes. This is just something that the Lord wants somebody to hear. That, that many times we start to get nervous because it looks like it's not going to go the way that we thought it was going to go. And we try to take matters in our own hands instead of being able to stay still and know that he's God. To trust him, to pray and to believe and let him show up and to do the work. That's important. That's important. Amen. Because he, he wants to teach us things. Amen. He wants to, he wants to teach us what it means to, to hear him, what it means to trust him, what it means to have faith in him. Amen. And if we're always trying to fix it, Lord knows I've been one of the worst with that. <laughs> trying to fix it, be a fixer. You know, no, we've got to learn to trust the Lord. Amen. Amen. I used to, I heard a preacher say one time, well, he knows how to hit the moving target. Yeah, but if he doesn't want me moving, why am I trying to make it harder? You know, I'm making it harder on myself. All right. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. You see, you, you understand when, I'm, when I said this in the beginning, how I'd never quite seen before how all of these people of faith, how they're all looking forward to the eternal destiny they're all looking forward to the promises, and this is the way that is being written. Uh, by faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover. What, that's a beautiful picture of the cross. Amen. Speaking in advance for you and I. And sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. He wasn't living in fear. Listen, church, I, I don't... Some of you, I mean, I don't mean this negatively, but sometimes we, we end up moving the Lord. Sometimes the Lord moves us for whatever reason. And I just want you, I just want you to know that, that no matter where we find ourselves in the yeah. next five years, yeah. okay, I just don't want you to forget something. You don't have to fear the king of the world. You don't have to fear the king of the world, the prince of this present age. We don't have to fear him. That's his tactic. He's a terrorist. But we don't have to fear Amen. him. We have victory in Christ. We have victory in the Passover lamb. We have victory in the blood that was applied to the doorpost and the side post. We have victory if we'll just stay in that place and if we will feed on the eternal lamb of God, we will receive the spiritual nutrition that we need to gain the strength that we need to face whatever comes our way. I just, wanted, I just felt like I needed Amen. to tell you that. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. You see, even still in this, we're seeing the plan of God. Because now God is moving. He saved Israel, right, through the blood of a lamb, foreshadowing the cross of Jesus Christ. And then now on the destination as we cross Jericho to move into the Red Sea, what does he do? He saves a Gentile woman. <laughs> he said, God always had a plan to save the Gentiles. And so that's what I'm trying to tell you. This whole thing is showing us. The will of God, the plan of God, and the people of God that are willing to believe him according to his will and his plan. Look what it says. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, the prophets, 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. What? Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. You know, I didn't know for sure if I was going to say this, but, but I am. I, I, as I was studying, I started thinking about something. Here we are in America praying that our son makes the football team. Listen, don't, don't get mad at me. We're praying that our daughter makes the cheer team. Women received back their dead. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. I, I'm not trying to say that God is not concerned about the minute details of our lives because I believe that he is. Yeah. I'm trying to make a point. Where is, our, where is our mind in the grand scheme of things? If this is true, and it is, where is, where is your mind? In the grand scheme of things. Where is, where is my mind then? No, 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 no. You, we, you need to be provoked. I need to be provoked. We need to be provoked to think the way that God thinks about his word. If it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable, that's probably a good thing. Because, because before it's over with, there's going to be some people at some point in time that are going to be really, really uncomfortable, like a lot of these people were really uncomfortable. And it's better to get uncomfortable now in the presence of the Lord and to get our heart right, to get our head right, to get ourselves connected to the will of God. Amen. Instead of being so consumed about this life. Yes. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. Man, that's just something, man. I think of walking up in the Mexican mountains in the rain with like sheep skin, like, dude, afflicted. Mistreated of whom the look, look at this scripture here, verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy. Mm. Oh man. Is that you see, in the eyes of God, when he sees the way that these people took his word and believed him and walked with him and lived for him, that they went through some horrendous things. But you want to know something? I you know, the commentators say that there was there's other documents that are out there that say Isaiah was the one that was sawn asunder. He was sawn in two, the prophet Isaiah. I mean, you can't prove it in the scripture, but that's what other right. Can you imagine that? Being sawn in two for the Lord. But can you imagine where he is now? He, he's all whole, my friend. <laughs> he's all whole, amen. And he is in a, he's in the place. Amen. Where, where, where he, he is happy that he's in that place. Amen. Amen. Of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, they did not receive what was promised. In other words, look, it says right here, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. In other words, they were the, they were the precursor. To the, to the conclusion. And they didn't even see the promise, which is Messiah, that was in the middle, that's able to cause the whole thing to come to pass. And that you and I, on the back end of the journey, may complete their front end of the journey. Amen. And one day, it's all going to come together. And there's going to be a multitude of white people dressed in white linen oh, wow. from both the Old Testament yes. and the New Testament. And we finally will have made it Church, listen, you got we gotta get it's time to get our mind yes, off I of guess. the temporal world that we're yes. living in. Yes. It's yes. time for us to get our yes. mind on the spiritual. Well, I'm not telling you not to go to work tomorrow. That would be ridiculous. Go to work, be the best you can be at work, earn your paycheck, pay your bills, amen. Be financially wise, but I'm trying to make a point. 
Do not be so connected to this world that you miss what God is doing. Now, let's preach. Amen. Or let's go ahead and let's teach whatever the Lord's got to say. Listen, there's a shaking coming, part one. We just read about this chapter 11 cloud of witnesses that believe God had a plan, lived their lives for him instead of themselves. In the first couple of verses of Hebrews chapter 12, and I mean, you don't have to try to put it up there. I'll let you know uh, when I need you to. But look, the, we are, the word of God says we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. People that have gone before us on the front end and made it to the other side. It's almost like if there was a courtroom of heaven and there's a prosecuting attorney and here you got Jesus, the plaintiff's attorney, and he's just standing there with his hand, nail-scored hand, saying, oh no, it's been paid for. They're not guilty. And there's a whole cloud of witnesses and they're watching the whole thing. They're watching your life, they're watching my life, and they're watching our journey. Come on, somebody, help me out. And they're saying, well, you know, uh, I don't know what they're saying. I don't know what they're saying about you. I don't know what they're saying about me, but I know one day I want my life to line up and I want them to be cheering me on. Amen. I want them to be cheering me on. And, and, and we got to realize that, that that's, some pretty, that's a pretty heavy cloud of witnesses right there. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's something else to have them in the jury box uh, listening to the testimonials. Of, of what's going on. You know, the, the accuser of the brethren, he accuses them before, he accuses the brethren day and night. Amen. He doesn't, we have one plea. We have one plea and it's the blood of Jesus. Praise God. That's really our only plea. And, and I got to tell you that, that we need to plead the blood of Jesus and we need to walk in the victory that he's given us. So we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. So what the scripture says, lay aside every weight and every sin so that you can run the race with endurance so that you can endure the race and so that you can make it through. And while you're running, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Okay, and you know, Jesus despised the shame, but he endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. He paved the way. Some, some people say that this, uh, the, where it says author and finisher describes the pioneer. He paved the way. He made the way. He went before us. It took him to have faith. You understand? I know that Jesus knew that the Father had him. But can you imagine Jesus? And he, and, he, and he says, it is finished. And he breathes out his last breath. The Bible says, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me, but I willingly lay it down. My Father gave me the authority to lay it down and to pick it up again. He had to literally breathe that last breath out. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And he released his life into the hands of the Father. Praise God. Lord, help us to release our lives into your hands. You know, the scripture goes on to say that he endured great hostility from sinners. He was holy and the world was fallen and they came against him and they tried to destroy him, but he endured. He remained under the trial of God. He stuck to it. Amen. He remained steadfast. He did not waver against the opposition. That's what the scripture says in verse three. It says, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. Have you ever grown weary? Like just in the struggles of life. You, you know, like if, if, you, if you're at, in your workplace, you feel like a bunch of people are coming against you. In, in, a, in a circle of friends, you feel like people are coming against you. And, you know, wherever you might be, have you ever felt like things are coming against you, life's coming against you, and you're starting to feel weary, and you're starting to feel worn down, I got to tell you that, that he said, he said, listen, consider him. The idea is to contemplate or to ponder Jesus. If you're starting to feel faint and weary, the, the scripture says to consider and to contemplate Jesus. That though the, that he had suffered great contradiction from sinners, he endured. He did not quit halfway up the hill. Praise God for that. The world was hostile against the Lord because he was completely different than the world. I'm sorry to say that much of the church is hostile towards the Lord too. I believe that. Listen, well, I'm not. 
Because it has embraced the ways of the world. And we have churches nowadays that, that we have churches nowadays that ordain homosexual priests, mm -hmm. homosexual pastors. You, you know, you, you preach this in Mexico right now and you go to prison. I, I'm just trying to make a point to you. The world is going askew. They, they think that people that believe this way are the enemy. And there's Listen, whenever they start talking about same-sex marriage, if you get on social media and you start scrolling, you will see people that go to churches, people that you know, that say, why can't they, why can't they be able to love? And, and, and it's contrary to the word of God. Amen. Listen, people, people say, oh, well, you're just a hater. You just hate. No, 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 no. I would say the same thing if they said, that about fornication. And I've been a fornicator. It's either right or it's wrong. The word of God says that it's wrong. And the world is trying to convince us that it's right. And the church is sitting back and allowing it to happen. Because the voice of the men of God, the women of God, there's less that are willing to stand up and to speak what needs to be spoken. I mean, there's, they're, they're out there, and praise God that they're out there. You know, we, we don't really want to talk about even like the concept of abortion. It's like, what in the world is going on? How are we allowing the things to happen on the earth? Babies being murdered by the millions, and we act like, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. Save the whales. It's like, Lord, help us. We have become so seared in our conscience. That we act like all this is normal activity because we've been inundated. Yeah. The church has warned that the last days will be characterized like 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 2 says this. The spirit expressly says in the latter times that look, some are going to depart from the faith. Yes. They're going to depart from the faith. Now that doesn't mean that they're not still sitting in the church. They're departing from the faith. And it says here that they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The word heed means to lend the ear. Just like whenever Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And, and, and the word heed means to lend the ear. So they're willing to lend their ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But they're not willing to lend their ear to the truth of God's word that would heal them like medicine. And, and they're going to speak lies in hypocrisy. He's talking about the church. They're going to speak lies in hypocrisy. And their conscience is going to be seared with a hot iron. <laughs> Jessica preached to the youth the other day. And she told, she told me that she used an illustration. She had an iron heated up. And I can't remember if she said she poured water on it. And she had it in the thing. And it was hot. And she stuck it in there and it started sizzling. Did it pop? Yeah, it popped. Dude, what a good illustration. Because see, when we open ourselves up to sin repeatedly, or when we allow ourselves to listen to false doctrine, that begins to it begins to sear our conscience yes. and we become hardened to the truth. And people, you know what's sad? Listen, you need to we need to pray for preachers. L listen to me. What's sad is, is that a lot of times, whenever people are doing this and they're they're concerned to, to not preach the truth, to not tell the truth. It's because they've, they've allowed their conscience to be seared and they don't even know that they're doing that. You do understand that your conscience can become seared. Has anybody ever had a seared conscience? I'm going to tell you right now, I've been in some spots before where I thought I was okay. And I'm going to tell you right now, I wasn't okay. And that's a, that is not a good place to be as a believer. And it's sure not a good place to be as a pastor. And you, we need to be, we need to be mindful to be praying for these men and women of God that that preach the gospel. Because listen, if their conscience is seared, what's happening to the people? Lord help us. Yeah. It says in Second Timothy chapter four, verses two through four, it said he t Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. 
<laughs> I was thinking about something. Have you ever seen how a baby will play with their ears? Now, let me just give you, this is a little side note. This is a little extra line. Y'all, if you got a baby or you know somebody with a baby. If your baby's messing with the ear and got a green runny nose and running a fever, it's probably a sign of, it's probably a sign of an ear infection. If your baby has no runny nose, no fever, and is playing with their ear and sucking their baba and is happy, that's a that's a comfort it's a comfort thing. Like for some reason they like to mess with their ears. <laughs> it, people want it, they want their ears to be tickled. It brings them comfort. It feels good. Tell me pleasant words, tell me things that my ears want to make my ears feel good. They will, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers, look at this, in accordance to their own desires. Nowadays, man, we just scroll through social media. Man, he's, he's too loud. <laughs> Get rid of him. He, oh, my gosh, he talked about sin. He talked about homosexual. Keep going. Oh, you know, and then here we go. Whatever he's saying, I like this guy. I like this guy. And then, and then, they, and then they just keep picking the preachers that tell them what they want to hear instead of what the Lord wants people to hear. And will turn away their ears from the truth. You, you know one of the things about the truth of the cross is this. It crucifies the flesh. But you know what else it does? Galatians 6.14 May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The Lord wants you and I to be crucified to this world and to the things of the world. The scripture says that he who loves the world or the things of the world, that the love of the Father is not in him. Lord, you need to do a work in our hearts, please, Lord, to where we will not love the world or the things of the world, but that instead we will be a people that are looking for that city. Amen. One of the things that I try to teach a lot is that the change of the cross is both immediate and progressive. Immediately, the believer becomes a new creation. And the Spirit of God is implanted into the heart and begins the transformation from the old creation in Adam to the new creation in Christ. But love of the world and preservation of self tries to prevent that metamorphosis from taking place. And the cloud of witnesses that goes before us shows us that there have been countless humans that believed God's word, chose the kingdom of God over the kingdoms of the world. And the result was that the world treated them the way that it treated Jesus. God wants to prepare our hearts so that we will be faithful to him. In the next section of Hebrews, if you can put verse five up and we're going to go all the way. We're going to also read. We'll read through eight. Uh, we're talking about discipline. The scripture says in verse 5, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Listen, I want to remind you at the end of this chapter, it says that there's going to be a shaking that takes place. And that if the purpose of the shaking is to see what is, can be removed and whatever can be removed is going to be removed so that whatever remains is going to be able to enter in. And what I'm trying to explain to you today is this, is that there's a cloud of witnesses that endured the shaking and made it to the other side. And the Lord wants to bring correction to your life and he wants to bring correction to my life now so that we will be prepared so that we can make it to the other side when the time is right. Because when the shaking happens and the shaking is going to happen, you need to be prepared in your heart and in your mind that you can endure just like Jesus endured when he endured the cross and despised the shame. But he knew the joy that was set before him. So he endured it. He endured it for the hope. Amen. It, it's not, it doesn't do any good to run the race and then at the very end, you don't even cross the finish line. And, and let me tell you something. They got people that think they got people that think, oh yeah, well when that time comes, it's all going to pan out. It's all going to pan out. And they got people that think that they're going to listen to me. That they're just going to go ahead, oh yeah, when the time comes, I'll be ready. Well, how are you going to be ready when you, if we can't even live for the Lord today? How, how are we going to, how do we think for one, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit can't throw a whole bunch of grace on you right there. When, and he will. He's going to be throwing, putting a whole lot of grace on people whenever the time is right. But what I'm trying to say is, is that if we have perpetually been living in such a way, contrary to the word of God, all of this time, how do we imagine in our heart and our mind that when we need him the most, we're just going to be right? It just doesn't make sense to me. 
Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chases and scourges every son whom he receives. That's the same word that talks about when they scourge Jesus. I don't know if this is good preaching or bad preaching. I don't know what kind of preaching you call it. But the, the word of the Lord says that God scourges those whom he loves. It, he says, if you, but if you endure chastening, verse 7, God deals with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you, the King James Version says, you're a bastard. Other, script, other translations say you're an illegitimate child. And you're not a son. You know, through the work of the cross and our response through faith, God has made us to be the sons of God. And we live in a world that increasingly hates correction and discipline. But our father is not of this world. That's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. God is a God of discipline. God is a God that wants to bring correction. And listen to me, every single person in this place, if you have either already discounted the word of God at times in your life and ignored the voice of God when he's trying to bring, or you're about to possibly, I hope not. Possibly, as he speaks to you through his word and through his voice, you may disobey him and it could open up a door that leads you down a path of heartache and sorrow. And I'm just here trying to encourage you and encourage myself to remember the word of God and to stay true by the grace of God. Because listen, you know, we used to talk about it and it's true. You can't just obey just because you want to obey. But no, it doesn't work that way. Jesus died on the cross and purchased grace for us. And through the grace and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we have the strength that we need to obey the word of God. Now help us, Lord, to surrender our hearts and our lives to you. Yeah. If you are truly a child of God and deserve to serve, desire to serve him, be prepared because there's some discipline coming. Because he's not going to allow you and I to stay the same. He's not, he's not going to allow it. He wants to change us. And it is the Spirit of God that does the changing. It, listen, they used to make fun of me because I preached so hard my veins pop out. That ain't changed nobody. My face turning red and veins popping out on my forehead doesn't change a person. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work and changes people based off of the cross. Amen. But look at some of these Psalms. Psalm 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept your word. <laughs> Sometimes people got to be afflicted, right? Let's see what, let's see what the uh, American Dictionary says about that. Afflicted. To cause pain or suffering to affect with trouble. Uh, Psalm 94, 12. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law. This is the word of the Lord. God disciplines those whom he loves. Look, people grow weary when the Lord disciplines them, right? They drag up, they tap out, they ask the coach to take them out of the game for a couple of plays. I was thinking about this. To me, if I would have, I would have never, and I'm not something special, I'm just telling you, that's the way my daddy, I would have never asked the coach to take me out of the game. Could take you out for a couple of plays, son? Because you're kind of tired? We don't have anyone else. You got to stay in the trenches and fight. I could, I was, I, I don't know why I went crazy with this, but I started to hear what, what, what one of my old football coaches would have told me. If you need a break, this is what you need to do. Go to the locker room and turn in your uniform because you don't understand the privilege of being on this team, son. So you need to just go ahead and go turn in your uniform. And I want to, I know that sounds harsh. Boy, he's a harsh preacher. Wow. He's so mean. Okay. So like, no, no, no. I want you to understand something. It is a privilege. We don't understand. Maybe you do. What, what we experienced, you may not even think it. Uh, what we experienced in worship tonight was a privilege. God showed up in this worship service with a crew of people that don't even normally practice together. And I don't know if you felt it. I don't know if you could hear it. But I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit was orchestrating some beautiful worship. And, and I'm just telling you, I felt it in my spirit. And I am so appreciative of people coming together and bringing their gift. But even more so, that God showed up and I was able to experience his presence in this house. I'm telling you right now. And, and listen, it's a privilege 
to be able to worship the kingdom. It is a privilege just to be able to walk into a house, into a sanctuary as a heater and an air conditioner, and that we can come here in the freedom and liberty to hear the to worship the Lord together, amen, and also to hear the word of the Lord. It's a privilege, church. You might not think it now, and I hope that you never ha have to see it another way. I honestly hope that you and I never have to see that another way. But I can promise you that there's people upon this earth that have not been able to experience the privileges that you and I experience on the regular and that we take for advantage. And, and, and I want you to know I don't want to be that God. I, I want to be thankful and I want to be grateful for what God has done. And what God wants to do. Amen? Amen? He calls you son. He is your father. And you are his son made possible through the death of, death of his only begotten son. He has a plan. And if you're going to really be his, there's going to be some discipline. Verse 6 says this. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline. You have to endure the discipline of the Lord, church. I have to endure the discipline of the Lord. When he disciplines, he's treating you as a son. Good fathers discipline their children. Amen. The conclusion of this chapter, again, is that there's a shaking coming. In the end, God is going to shake everything, and only that which remains will enter the kingdom. Therefore, you must endure the chastening of the Lord. Your eternity depends on it. I believe that. No, your, your, your eternity is secure in Christ and what he's done for you at the cross. But listen, in order to stay on the right path, the Lord is desiring to do a work in your heart. He wants to get into the depths of your heart. This is all connected to search my heart and try the reins. He wants us... To, he wants us to yield ourselves to him and let him have his way. Amen. In verses 8 through 10, he says, If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. Believe this. He disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. Yes. That, that's the end result. He wants you and I to be able to share in his holiness. So a true child of God participates in the discipline of the Lord, or else they're not a true child of God. It's a good thing if he's trying to discipline you. Amen? Amen. I remember this, oh, something. My mom's not here tonight. She probably wouldn't remember. It just popped in my head when I was thinking about this discipline. I can remember being about 13 years old. We lived in two different houses on Normandy Circle in Lafayette, Louisiana. I was about 13, and I don't know if it was a concert or a circus. I don't know what it was. I was the most manipulative, little obnoxious kid. Like, I, my mama couldn't control me. My daddy lived in Houston. We lived in Lafayette. And don't get me wrong, had he showed up, I'd been <laughs> tripping a little bit. But he never did. And it was just like, I got away with whatever I wanted to. And I can remember my mom said, Matthew, if you don't act right, you're not going to the circus. <laughs> and yeah, I didn't act right. And so she punished me from the circus. But when it came time to go to the circus, she didn't really mean it. This ain't really going down. I'm going to still get my way. No, 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 no. She said, no, Matthew, you're not going to the circus. I can remember. I could see the visual of it. Like, I was so frustrated. I was so angry. The spirit of rebellion was all over me. Have you ever felt that way, like, in your life? Like, you're going through something, and it's like you're getting tired of it. And you'd be like... Want to stomp your feet and you can't get free from it. I'm telling you, I was so frustrated. And then listen, guy, sometimes these things happen in our life. The way that God's not trying to keep you away from the circus, he could care less about that. The way he'll chastise you is through all different forms and fashions. He will. He'll allow spiritual, he'll allow financial famine to take place. He'll allow discord to start taking place in relationships. He'll allow things to start shifting at work. And the whole time, whenever he's allowing these things to happen, listen, I'm not trying to say it's always this, but I am trying to say sometimes it's because he's trying to get people's attention. 
And he's trying, but what will happen is if we're not careful, we'll start looking at everybody else but ourselves. We'll start blaming this person over here. We'll start blaming that person over there. We'll start blaming the economy will start blaming and sometimes those things might have a little bit of truth in it but what i have learned the hard way is this every single time something negative starts happening in the church something negative starts happening at work something negative starts happening in my life i have learned to look at myself first I'm just going to tell you right now. And you, as a child of God, would do well to learn that lesson. To quit thinking that it's always somebody else and to start with me, Lord. What are you trying to show me? And if we will learn to do that, he, he likes it when you allow him to speak to you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to close with this and... The singers and musicians can come up because I've gone a little long, but out of James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, it says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. You know, that word implanted, because in the King James it says engrafted, but the word in the Greek actually describes a seed being planted. And I couldn't help but think of how a uh, embryo implants itself in the uterus. You know what I'm saying? And I was thinking about how whenever we're born again, because we're just coming off of the, the the heels of Christmas, and how Jesus was was implanted on the inside of Mary, and how we were talking about Jesus be born in me. And that whenever, whenever we get born again, the Holy Spirit, I mean, you know, the presence of the Lord comes to live on the inside. It is the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Lord is implanted on the inside of us. And as we yield, he begins to grow. Amen. So the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, he says, but look at this, but be doers, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, isn't that something that you can be a hearer of the word but not a doer and you're deceiving yourself? I mean, listen, think about it. People could show up to church. People could read their Bible. They're reading it. They're listening to the preacher preach and they're hearing the word of God and they think that they've done something good. And I'm not saying that they have. It's good that at least they're in church. But if they're hearing but not doing, the scripture says they, they, they could be deceiving themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, it's not talking about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about the, talking about the law of God's word. That you have, we have to understand that if we will look into the law of God's word, if we will look into the word of the living God and we will be a doer by the grace of God of the word of God, that, that it will result in liberty for our lives. Amen. And if we will persevere, not just being a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. We give you glory and honor for your word. Lord, I thank you for the cloud of witnesses that is going before us, oh Lord God. I thank you that you've made a way, you've paved a way, oh Lord God. Lord, I know that there's times that you discipline your children. I pray, Lord God, that through this word that you would help us to recognize when you're bringing discipline into our lives. And that we would be willing to yield to you, Lord. That we would yield our heart to you to allow you to have your way with us, oh Lord God. We want to grow in Christ. Lord, I pray for the people in this church that we would grow to a place of maturity, oh Lord God. Now, I, I just pray that you'd have your way with us tonight as we worship you, Lord. Let your presence minister to our hearts in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.